Good morning. Hello. We'll wait till a few more people come in. Looks like there's about 20 people out in the narthex, so we'll just invite everybody to come in to join us for worship this morning. Okay. Welcome to Redeemer United Church of Christ, located in Sussex, Wisconsin. I am Katherine Richardson, and I'm the liturgist for today. Our storyteller is Jim Showalter. Um, please take a minute to fill out our who's where in the chair, either online or in person, and we appreciate you connecting with us this morning. Here at, Re here at Redeemer, we are learning to love more. Our called pastor is Reverend Julie Eklund, who is currently on sabbatical. Our consistent pastoral presence during this time is Reverend Dr. Martha Brunel. Today, we celebrate the fourth Sunday of Easter, also known as Good Shepherd Sunday. Our welcoming music today is provided by Dan Stolper and Mary Dolborella. Shepherd lead us, much we need your tender care. In your pleasant pasture fields, for our use your folds prepare. Blessed Jesus. Jesus, you have bought us yours, we are. Blessed Jesus, 
Thank you for that beautiful music. There's something about a familiar song that just makes you feel like the Holy Spirit's washed over you. So thank you very much. Please join in our opening meditation. In a comfortable position, relax into the natural rhythm of your breath. Take a few moments to breathe and release any tension your body holds in your face, in your shoulders, in your torso, in your arms, in your hands, in your legs, in your feet. Breathe and release stored anxiety wherever it rests within you. Close your eyes. Place your open palms facing upward on your thighs, ready to receive the gift of your breath, to receive again and again the gift of your life. Relish the stillness in the midst of a busy world. Breathe in God's resurrection, promises of new life. Breathe out hope for yourself, for all beings who are your neighbors, for the earth that we share. Breathe in, I receive new life. Breathe out, I give back hope. Breathe in, I receive new life. Breathe out, I give back hope. Breathe in, I receive new life. Breathe out, I give back hope. Breathe in God's resurrection promises. Breathe out your hope even in the turmoil, distress, weakness, pain, and loneliness of the world we know. Continue this gentle breath with open hands no longer trying to hold everything, but rather willing and ready to receive gifts extended to you. Breathe in, I receive new life. Breathe out, I give back hope. Breathe in, I receive new life. Breathe out, I give back hope. Breathe in, I receive new life. Breathe out, I give back hope. As you breathe from a deeper and deeper place within, clear away any clutter between your hearts and the beckoning voice of God. Breathe in, I receive new life. Breathe out, I give back hope. Breathe in, I receive new life. Breathe out, I give back hope. Breathe in, I receive new life. Breathe out, I give back hope. And now, with open hands and open hearts, come back to this space and time and open your eyes.
Listen, be open to the most ordinary moments, to the quiet in the dailiness. Show up to embrace the sacred, I am here. Please note today our prayer of confession is responsive, and as always, you have the bold print. Lost in the thick layers of gloominess, I call out, where are you? I'm here. Whisper back. As I strain to hear your voice, are you really here, I echo? Trust me, comes the response. But I can't see, I complain. You reply through the heavy fog. Is it not enough that I am here? We can see beneath the surface of things. We can hear the voice that might go unnoticed. We're invited to do that seeing and hearing, to say yes to life, to look and to listen for how to love more, and then to trust that we are not left alone, but rather are always held in the great holy ground of being. Our scripture today is John 10, 1 through 10. The truth of the matter is, whoever doesn't enter the sheepfold through the gate, but climbs in some other way is a thief and a robber. The one who enters through the gate is the shepherd of the sheep, the one for whom the keeper opens the gate. The sheep knows the shepherd's voice. The shepherd calls them by name and leads them out. Having led them out, all out of the fold, the shepherd walks in front of them and they follow because they recognize the shepherd's voice. They simply won't follow strangers. They'll flee from them because they don't recognize the voice of strangers. Even though Jesus used this metaphor with them, they didn't grasp what he was trying to tell them. He therefore said to them again, the truth of the matter is, I am the sheep gate. All who came before me were thieves and marauders, whom the sheep didn't need. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be safe. You'll go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and to slaughter and destroy. I came that you might have life and have it to the full. I'd like to invite our young people to come forward. How are you this morning? Ooh, there are lots of you. This is wonderful. We're going to find our appropriate seats. Okay. When it gets warm, maybe after Memorial Day, <laughs> maybe after Father's Day, maybe by the 4th of July. When it gets warm, how many of you like to go swimming? 
Do you like to swim in a river or a lake or a pool? I like to play in the lake. All of them, all of the above. Yes. Oh, do you? Is it really deep and cold in the quarry? Oh, it's been a long time since I've gone swimming in a quarry. Anyway, I want to talk about a swimming game today, which you may have played. How many of you have ever played Marco Polo? Oh, terrific, terrific. Okay, I wish I knew all of your names. I need a volunteer. Oh, Mr. Packers, what's your name? Luke, will you be my volunteer? Okay. So, how many of you know how to play Marco Polo? Oh, most people, not everybody. So, Marco Polo is a swimming game. It takes its name from the explorer who went along the great trade routes. And I've usually played it in a pool. You could play it in a lake. And one person with their eyes open says, Marco. And the other person, no, the person with their eyes closed says, Marco, who's trying to get to Polo. And Polo has their eyes open and says, Polo, in response. So Marco moves towards Polo. Do I have that right? Okay, so Marco, why don't you go over there and close your eyes. Okay, and we'll start. Oh no, I have to say polo, he's coming. <laughs> but you know what, I love enthusiasm and, and I'm all about participation. So you can get ready for summer, which is coming when you can play this, okay? We're gonna, this is take two. All right. Polo. Marco. Polo. Marco. Polo. He's got good ears or maybe a little help, but thank you. <laughs> thank you for demonstrating Marco Polo. And I brought that game today not to make you wish that it was summertime, but because we just heard a story about a voice that you recognize and a voice that you move toward. Jesus told a story about a shepherd and the sheep knew the shepherd by the sound of the shepherd's voice. And the sheep followed the shepherd because they recognized that voice. And a lot of our life and faith is about recognizing the voice of God. And we can recognize it in other people. We can recognize it in the natural world. We can recognize it in events, but we're always listening so that we can recognize that voice and move toward it. So the next time you play Marco Polo and you're having a lot of fun, remember that God is playing with you, okay? And thank you, you were terrific this morning. And you can rejoin your families. I know that all of you haven't been here the last two weeks, so we're making our way through Seed, folks, a book with 13 characters in a garden, and I'm going to be here 13 weeks, so there's a character for each week. We started with Kim, a young Vietnamese girl who never knew her father because her mother was pregnant with her when her father died, a farmer in Vietnam. And she plants some seeds in a junk-filled lot on a fictitious street in Cleveland called Gibbs Street because she wants her father to know her and see her. Meanwhile, Anna, who's lived there since she was a child when it was a Romanian neighborhood, 
worked for the uh, parole department for many years, and she sees something being buried behind a refrigerator, and she knows it's either a gun or money or drugs. She goes out, she digs up the seeds. She's horrified at what she's done. She puts them back in the ground. Enter Wendell. My phone doesn't ring much, which suits me fine. That's how I got the news about our boy. Shot dead like a dog in the street. And the word last year about my wife's car wreck. I can't hear a phone and not jerk inside. When Anna called, I was still asleep. Phone calls that wake me up are the worst. Get up here quick, she says. I live on the ground floor and watch out for her a little. We're the only white people left in the building. I ran up the stairs. I could tell it was serious. I prayed I wouldn't find her dead. When I got there, she looked perfectly fine. She dragged me over to the window. Look down there, she says. They're dying. What? I yelled back. The plants, she says. I was mad. She gave me some binoculars and told me all about the Chinese girl. I found the plants and got them in focus. There were four of them in a row, still little. They were wilted. Leaves flopped flat on the ground. What are they? She asked. Some kind of beans. I grew up on a little farm in Kentucky. But she planted them way too early. She's lucky those seeds even came up. But they did, said Anna. And it's up to us to save them. Now, it was a weekend in May and hot. You'd have thought those beans were hers. They needed water, especially in that heat. She said the girl hadn't come in four days, sick probably, or gone out of town. Anna had twisted her ankle and couldn't manage the stairs. She pointed to a pitcher. Fill that up and soak them good, quick now. Sewell janitors take much too much bossing all week to listen to an extra helping on weekends. I stared at her one long moment, then took my time about filling the pitcher. I walked down the stairs and into the lot and found the girl's plants. You don't plant beans till the weather's hot. Then I saw what kept her seeds from freezing. The refrigerator in front of them had bounced the sunlight back on the soil, heating it up like an oven. I bent down and gave the dirt a feel. It was hard packed and light colored. I studied the plants, leaves shaped like spades in a deck of cards. Definitely beans. I scraped up a ring of dirt around the first plant to hold the water and any rain that fell. I picked up the pitcher and poured the water slowly. Then I heard something move and spun around. The girl was there, stone still, 10 feet away, holding her own water jar. She hadn't seen me behind the refrigerator. She looked afraid for her life. Maybe she thought I'd jump up and grab her. I gave her a smile and showed her that I was just giving her plants some water. This made her eyes go even bigger. I stood up slowly and backed away. I smiled again. She watched me leave. We never spoke one word. I walked back there that evening and checked on the beans. They picked themselves up and were looking fine. I saw that she'd made a circle of dirt around the other three plants. Out of nowhere, the words from the Bible came into my head, and a little child shall lead them. I didn't know why at first. 
But then I did. There's plenty about my life I can't change. Can't bring the dead back to life on this earth. Can't make the world loving and kind. Can't change myself into a millionaire. But a patch of ground in this trashy lot, I can change that. Change can change it big. Better to put my time to that than moaning about everything else the other day. That little grammar school girl showed me that. The lot had buildings on three sides. I walked around and picked myself out a spot that wouldn't be shaded too much. I dragged the garbage off to the side and tossed out the biggest pieces of broken glass. I looked over my plot, squatted down, and fingered the soil a while. That Monday, I brought a shovel home from work. We are sharing this sermon time this morning with two sheep, two Scottish sheep, um, who uh, live and eat and reproduce on the island of Iona, which is off the coast of Scotland in the Inner Hebrides. So two friends I made last summer when I was there. 45 years ago today, on April the 30th, 1978, I successfully candidated for my first position as a pastor of a local church. Now, we refer to people who live their lives by a pastoral rhythm as people who live by vocation. I've observed across a lifetime that many people live by vocation, whether they teach, whether they're paramedics, whether they're gardeners or musicians, whether they keep a home, clean an office, run an elevator. Vocation is about how you do your work, how you live your life as an example of God's resurrecting love as an example of kindness and care and community. Vocation is related to voice, to hearing. And the question today in the text, and certainly the question when you're playing Marco Polo, is what voice are you hearing And how do you move toward that voice? We're going to begin with a little bit of audience participation. And we're going to use a practice that's used in the African bush. And whenever someone has been away for the day or part of the day, when that person comes back, those people at home say, we see you. And the person responds back, I am here. The person coming home hears the voices of those whom they love and lived with. We see you. And then responds back so that they can hear, I am here. So I'm going to ask anyone out here who has a birthday between January and March, to please stand. Okay, so you are going to be coming back to us at Redeemer, and the rest of us are going to say to you, we see you. Thank you. And you can sit so that we make room for the April, May, June folks. If you have a birthday during those months, please stand. And to you we say, 
we see you, and you respond. Okay. And now my favorite group, the July, August, September people, because that's my group. Oh, stand up. And you all say to us, I am here. Please be seated. And then those who close out the year in October, November, and December. Oh, I see you over there. And we say to you, we see you. Thank you. We spend a lifetime in faith. Like Kim, who starts our garden story off. Wanting to be seen by God. Wanting to hear God's presence, hear God's voice, know how to come home, where to follow, how to live our lives. Wendell is a perfect partner from our story for a day about hearing. Wendell hears way too many voices during the week in his job as a school janitor. Clean this up. Fix that. Set up this room. Move this over here. By the end of the week, he's had enough, but he looks out for Anna, who never hesitates to make a demand. Come up here, come up here right now and take care of this. And he kind of takes his sweet time taking care of it. And in the process, he hears the plants and the ground whose voices he knows well. He knows not only do the plants need water, but they need a trench to hold that water. And he trenches the first plant and waters it, and then hears behind him a sound. And there is Kim. And they never exchange a word between them. But she has not seen what he has done. And he knows how to be around children. He spends all week doing that. And he carefully backs away and smiles at her and leaves her room. But then later in the day, checks on those four bean plants, all of which are trenched now, and all of which have had a drink. And in that moment, not so long after remembering the sound of telephone calls, the voices that brought him the news of the death of a son, and the accident that his wife has been in, he hears again the sound of the ground. And God doesn't need human beings to speak through. He hears the sound of the ground. And he hears the sound of a small child whose first four straggly beans remind Wendell that he knows how to grow things, that remind Wendell that when he's growing things, he feels alive. He feels like a person of resurrection who is creative, who rises again and again into new life. So who's the sheep and who's the shepherd in this story? Is Kim, 
who so wanted to be seen by her father to feel connected. At first she sounds like a sheep looking for a shepherd, but clearly in this chapter of the story, she is the shepherd for Wendell. Through Anna's intervention and voice, Wendell ends up on that junk strewn lot and hears the voice of a small child that leads him back to a place of life. These last few weeks at the end of the service we have been singing, uh, won't you let me be your servant? Let me be as Christ to you. I will bear the Christ light for you. Christ literally means anointed. And the Christ presence in the world is where the purpose of eternity gets all bound up with everything material, with everything physical. And is there that we step into the fullness of God's presence. And it is there where we hear God's voice and where we carry that presence and that voice to others. So sometimes we're the sheep and sometimes we're the shepherd. Today's chapter and the whole story of Seed Folks reminds us of the ways that the Christ anointing presence, the voice of God, is heard in the natural world around us, is heard on the beautiful prairie on this space, is heard in the quarry where one of our young people loves to swim, is often time heard in trees. Any of you have a favorite tree anywhere? Aunt Frank had a favorite tree. It was a white chestnut. The house in which she and her family sought refuge for two years is tall and narrow like all of the rest of the houses in Amsterdam. And as you look at the house, to the right, there's an open area, now just an open square, where a white chestnut tree stood for about 175 years. When Anne and her family were in hiding, if you went up to the attic, there was a slanted window in the roof that wasn't covered because no one could see in that window and they never had any lights on in there. But from that slanted window, Anne could watch that tree. She writes about it several times in her diary. She writes about the comfort it brings her. She writes about how beautiful it is, what it is to watch it come into bloom. And chestnuts are really beautiful when they're blooming. She talks about the gulls in the tree. She talks about how the tree keeps her connected to the world beyond those tight walls where they are hiding. And died in 1945. The white chestnut was aging badly by 2005. And someone in Amsterdam got permission to start collecting what we would call the Buckeyes. Um, and they were germinated and they became little sprouts that were nourished. And in 2010, an electrical storm finally brought the tree down. But there were lots of little trees. There's a whole forest in the Netherlands of these trees. Eleven of them came to the U.S. 2010, 11, through there. 
they caught my attention because I had been following the late years of the tree. And they came to my attention because one of those trees is planted in the county where I did most of my growing up. And it's planted there because the climate is right. It's planted there because there was a plan to take care of it. And it's planted there because that is a place where a number of civil rights issues and questions of justice overlap. I grew up in the town where Harriet Tubman made her home after the Civil War because William H. Seward, who was Lincoln's Secretary of State, made sure she got a piece of property. I grew up in a county that is adjacent to Seneca Falls, where the 1848 Women's Convention took place. And I grew up in a county that is also adjacent to Oswego, New York. You know when you hear about Buffalo getting six or eight feet of snow in the winter? Well, Oswego is at the eastern edge of Lake Ontario. Guess who gets more snow? Smaller town. There was one boatload of Jewish refugees who were received into this country as the Second World War was beginning, just one. They ended up in Oswego, New York, which is why there is a tree in the side yard of a small rural school in Cayuga County in upstate New York. There's a tree at um, Ground Zero in Liberty Park. There's a tree in Washington, D.C., near the Capitol. There was a tree on the Boston Common that didn't make it. There were a couple of trees in Little Rock, one at Central High and one at the Clinton Library that I think must have disagreed with the climate. There's a tree in Indianapolis at the Children's Museum. There's a tree outside Detroit at the Holocaust Museum. There's a tree at Sonoma State in California. Uh, it's this incredible Holocaust and Genocide Memorial Park that remembers everyone. And there's a tree in Boise, Idaho at the Anne Frank Museum. Because of the tree in Cuyahoga County, New York, I have visited many of them. I will finish visiting them next year. I got interrupted by COVID. Um, and I also have been to Amsterdam in the midst of this. Those trees, wherever they are, speak to so many of us about places of pain in our history, places of injustice, places of courageous action. They shepherd us and they call us forth to more love where we are in whatever ways we can participate. There's one other tree I want to talk about this morning. It's somewhere between 250 and 300 years old. No one knows exactly. Trees don't have birth certificates. It's a bur oak. It has stood since 1868 inside of the Lincoln Park Zoo in Chicago. When the zoo was built, it was built around the bur oaks that were there. Bur oaks, savanna, and prairie land once came all the way to the lake. Bur oaks, savanna is the smallest habitat around the globe. We've lost most of it. Our bur oak has died, and tomorrow it will come down. But there has been this massive effort in Chicago to say goodbye to a tree that towered over Potawatomi villages and bears and whatever else went on and came to the lake in those years. It survived the great fire of 1871. It was several blocks inside the fire zone. It is a tree that has seen that land long before the city of Chicago was there. And so Friday and Arbor Day, there were tours and presentations. People wrote letters of thanks to the tree. They're hoping when they bring it down that the wood's gonna be in a state that they can save it 
to make all sorts of art, beautiful artistic things out of it. I don't think most of us who went to say goodbye went in sadness, we went in gratitude. I went yesterday after spending six hours on Zoom in a meeting, carrying my umbrella because it was supposed to rain, it didn't. And on my way out of the zoo, I have pretty good peripheral vision, and I caught sight of a bird in flight. And I was pretty sure it was a heron, but I always see herons in flight from one source of water to another. And I'm staring at the tree, and this older couple comes by, and they said, who are you looking for? And I said, I think a heron, um, but I didn't get a good look at it. Oh yes, they nest in there. Look right up there and you can see it and I couldn't see it. But I came around the corner of this sand of trees including a number of birches. And there are like 70 nests. And they're being built right now because it's the beginning of the breeding season which will go on till August and we can see them because there aren't any leaves in the way. So I had gone to the zoo to honor a death, I came out of the zoo in the midst of life. If you want to talk about a resurrection walk, as our story is a resurrection story, as any time when we can hear the voice of the holy in one another, in an event, in places on our earth, when we hear that voice and we get called to a certain quality of life, we get called to a hopefulness in the midst of despair, we get called to a life of action where there seems to be nothing to do, we get called to a life of appreciation and gratitude when there's much to crab about, we listen for the voice that keeps calling us back to the reality of resurrection, to the reality of new life, to the reality of you are not left alone. You are my beloved as is everything on this earth. And with you I remain. And among you, I call you to newness, to care, to creativity, to joyful service, to a capacity to be where the wounds are, to tell the stories, to be willing to be both sheep, the ones who hear, and shepherds, the one who lead. And so in our fictitious, wonderful story on Gibbs Street in Cleveland, in the text from John on this Good Shepherd Sunday, and every Good Shepherd Sunday we read one chunk of John 10. This is the best chunk, the chunk with the voice. In the text of your lives and this place with prairies, with trees, with bodies of water, we are called to life, to listen for that call and to be able to say, I am here. Sheep or shepherd, this day or another, I am here. Thanks be to God. Before we sing our middle song, I just want to mention that um, one of the spiritual practices we're going to use in worship while I'm here is the practice of chant. And this is a chant we'll be using. I know you have sung it before. I remember the first time that Pastor Julie sang it at an event in the church I was serving in Northern Illinois. And I remember she said she was going to bring it here um, because of the prairie. Um, it's a garden song. 
You shall be like a garden. And so we will sing this together as many times as our musicians choose to lead. As many times as they shepherd us, we will sing. And remember when we're chanting, we don't have a whole bunch of words to read or remember, but the words can really sink inside of us. The prayer person of the week is Marty Davis. Contact information is found in your bulletin or will be in this week's Redeemer Reminders. And I believe Marty is here today, so please give her a hug and say hello. And for the prayers of the people, George and Sharon Streeter would like to uh, pray for Robert Streeter. A prayer of gratitude, Robert's cancer is in remission. Praise be. A prayer request, request from Steve and Debbie for our daughter, Melissa, for the charter school where she works in Phoenix, Arizona. The school recently suffered through their principal and vice principal being fired suddenly without cause by a corporate conservative board. Students and their families are in crisis and graduation is three weeks away. Prayers from the Rockies. First, family of Angie Kukat, and then second, family of Nate Gritter. Both died this week. Angie, lifelong friend and classmate of Michelle, passing after rapid decline in Fargo, North Dakota. 
Nate, a close friend of Bob and three nephews in Georgia, died age 31 um, from diabetes and complications. Also from the Rockies, Dorothy, and I apologize, I probably say this wrong, Kratt, Kratt, sister of Michael Rocky, prayers, I'm sorry, Michelle Rocky, sorry, <laughs> prayers for recovery from dehydration and other conditions in the hospital five days in North Dakota and now home with family. She's 86. As we continue our service in a time of prayer in response to those concerns that have been voiced and other concerns that we carry in our hearts, I will tell you that after a few moments of silence, our spoken prayer part will be a version of the 23rd Psalm, which is traditionally read on Good Shepherd Sunday. And I will be reading the 23rd Psalm in a prayerful voice as it was revoiced by Bobby McFerrin about 1990, revoiced in honor of his mother amongst many of the women who have been such powerful shepherds in the African-American community. The first time I heard this in January of 92, I wept, and I am not a public weeper um, because I so heard the voice of God. Let us pray. The Lord is my shepherd. I have all I need. She makes me lie down in green meadows. Beside the still waters she will lead. She restores my soul. She rights my wrongs. She leads me in a path of good things and fills my heart with songs. Even though I walk through a dark and dreary land, there is nothing that can shake me. She has said she won't forsake me. I'm in her hand. She sets a table before me in the presence of my foes, and I anoint my head with oil, and my cup overflows. Surely, surely, goodness and kindness will follow me all the days of my life, and I will live in her house forever forever and ever. Glory be to our mother and daughter and to the Holy of Holies, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. And once more, we speak together the prayer of our tradition, saying with each other, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done 
on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And we have some helpers that are going to help with the uh, offering. Our invitation, our invitation to generosity. Share with others the fullness of spirit that flows from your religious life. Give of yourself. Give time, not just money. Give directly, not just impersonally. Above all, give love. We're doing something a little bit different today. You'll see some of our youth that are gonna be helping do the gold cans and the plate offering. It is a tradition that we've had in the past and we are bringing that back to Redeemer. The gold can Sussex Outreach Service. The Sussex Food Pantry was named Sussex, Out Sussex Outreach Services to reflect the expanding circle of concern for which they want to provide. In addition to the food available, the program has financial assistance for housing, utility, and medical bills for families in desperate situations. Please give generously, as any amount will be tremendous help to the Sussex Outreach Service. And as I mentioned, our youth are helping today with the um, gold cans and the plates. If you also would like to leave something, you can contribute um, by leaving your offerings online um, at our website or mail into the church and thank you for your generosity. I'll just give everybody a moment. And let us pray. We give as we have received, abundantly and joyfully, while celebrating our connection, our belonging, and our mutual well-being with a widening circle of life. Please join singing our departing song.
Before our words of benediction, I want to remind you of our Wednesday night Zoom session on spiritual practices. This week we will be looking at the practice of beauty. And Saturday is our first retreat. And so there are flyers and there's stuff online. Please join us. We will be uh, engaging in the practice of the labyrinth on World Labyrinth Day and walking with people all over the globe. Today's benediction, whose words are from Roshani, will end with another small shepherd chant. Shepherd me, O God, beyond my wants, beyond my fears, from death into life. There is a brokenness out of which comes the unbroken, a shatteredness out of which blooms the unshatterable. There is a sorrow beyond all grief which leads to joy, and a fragility out of whose depths emerges strength. There is a hollow space too vast for words, through which we pass with each loss, out of whose darkness we are sanctioned into being. There is a cry deeper than all sound, whose serrated edges cut the heart as we break open to the place inside, which is unbreakable and whole while learning to sing. opportunities for you to serve this week. Redeemer will host a Narcon training run by staff of Waukesha County Health Department on Tuesday, May 16th at 30. It's free, open to the public, and last about 30 to 60 minutes. See Bob Rocky for details. We'd like to thank everyone who made this morning possible for worship. Dan, Marion, John, Usher, it says Rick Fulbrecht, but I do believe Sue was also ushering, so thank you to Sue. Zoom moderator Jim Schulter, greeters Rick and Nancy Volbrecht, and fellowship hosts the Eggert family. And the Richardson family. <laughs> Our council is encouraging everyone to get back into the habit of wearing your name tags. We'd like to help out Pastor Martha when she is with us. Um, for open and affirming ONA education session, we are pleased to offer our first in-person education session on Sunday, May 7th, after worship. Join us for open and affirming 101. Spiritual practices with past Pastor Martha on Zoom Wednesday night, 7 p.m. will run through July 5th. Friday community office hours will continue at Local Latte from 11 to 1 and will be hosted by Redeemer members. 
As a reminder, faith formation for all ages is underway in for spring session. We're going to be tying in with a sabbatical message of new connectedness with our spirit, new growth and spiritual renewedness. This is a great opportunity for anyone who would like to volunteer. We're always in need of teachers. Parents, please encourage your youth to nurture the butterfly and hum hummingbird sprouts and check their weekly journal entries as we watch the young minds explore the Redeemer grounds and various ecosystems. And we are, like I said, currently seeking adult faith members to assist with these outdoor sessions and partner with our faith leaders for this week's session. Pastor Julie has begun her three month sabbatical. Our office administrator, Casey Cleary, has a church cell phone and will connect with you, connect you with a volunteer for any pastoral emergencies. Anyone interested in being trained on the use of the AED automated external def defibrillator is invited to stay for a brief in service after the service today. Questions can be directed to Ann Matthews or Michelle Rocky. Pastor Mark will be leading us in three retreats during her time with us, first one this week. Join us on May 20th at 4.30 for a potluck dinner. All are welcome and will be eating at 5.30 p.m. Sign up below if you plan to attend, I'm assuming that means out in an narthex, possibly. Um, the below would be hard for you to sign up on here, so. <laughs> um, I read what I'm given, I guess. <laughs> and please indicate if you plan to pass the dish. Direct, in, uh, direct any questions to Michelle Rocky. We need people to do both hand mowing, trimming, and lard area mowing with zero turn mower. Sign up online or reach out to the facilities team or church office. If you need any training on the equipment, please contact Kim. Sorry, there's a lot. Cemetery board met to assess the RUCC cemetery grounds recently, and we are planning for a cemetery workday. The first done there since 2006. The goal is to seek volunteers from Redeemer and beyond to meet there on Saturday, June 10th, starting at 9 a.m. Rain date would be June 17th. You can contribute. The council has decided to resurrect the tradition, as we mentioned earlier, the passing of the piece, uh, sorry, the passing of the offering plate in the gold can. Please take one of these tiny scrolls. Oops. Tiny scrolls that you'll find everywhere. Okay. Um, <laughs> in the plate, I guess. They contain different statements written by Redeemer members on why I give to Redeemer. And then I'd like to invite Debbie Hecke to come up to talk about the refugee assistance team. Today we are celebrating that we have had contact with our two families. Last Wednesday, nine from the members of cluster churches, including four from uh, Redeemer, went down to Milwaukee and we met with the two families, along with two representatives from, actually three representatives from Lutheran Social Services, one of them being an interpreter, which is very important at this stage. We have two families, they are Rohingya, and they are now residing in a community in, near close to Marquette uh, University. And uh, the best thing is when we were there, we had such trouble finding a place for to rent to them. This one fell into everyone's lap, and the gentleman opened up, I believe, 11 apartments for refugees for Lutheran Social Services. So they're wonderful. There were trees, speaking of trees today in the sermon, there were trees in the courtyard out front. Uh, the apartment itself, the one that we were in, was beautiful. It was clean. It was fresh looking. And the family was delightful. We met with all of them. They brought them. They even had to wake up a little one or two for, for naps to come down and visit with us. And that family consists the main, the larger family is two adults, the parents. They have five children living with them. One of, they range from the age of two to 19. Uh, for some of them, it was their first day of school that day. The other family, the, the mother is actually the daughter of the other family. 
and she married her, so she and her husband, and a two-year-old and a four-year-old. And they were all delightful. They were so hospitable. We could not speak each other's language. There was, they knew some, a small amount of English, but more than anything, it was their smiles and their eye contact. And they're saying, yes, we are ready. We are eager. And it was, it was wonderful. Our next step will be, we are planning on meeting uh, two times a week, taking maybe three members in. Our main concern, first of all, is getting that employment. And we are giving a gratitude of thanks to Linda Gravener-Smith, who is going to be the one finding out their qualities, their skills, and looking around uh, where they can fit in best. The nicest thing we heard is Lutheran Social Services said, there are two companies right here within walking distance that are welcoming these refugees. So we are blessed, we are excited, and we wanted to share that with everyone and didn't want to wait for another meeting somewhere else. But we're excited and we have sent funds on over there uh, to Lutheran Social Services from Redeemer. And we want to keep you posted on that. So again, your, our gratitude to you. May you, your prayers continue for our mission here on this. Thank you very much. Go forth. Have a good day. Thank you. Have a good day, everyone.